Professor Yaron Rokema. He's an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Twente. His expertise and interests are in tissue engineering, vascularization, and the role that the biomedical signals play in these processes. He focuses on engineering tools to tune the cellular environment, including embedded bioprinting approaches. He has directed 3.5 million euro in research funding. He has won many awards and fellowships. He has received a Veni fellowship from NWO, as well as an international outgoing fellowship, which is part of the Maria Skolowska Curie Actions of the European Commission. In 2017, he received a European Council Consolidator Grant and 2019, an ERC proof of concept grant. He is also the work package leader in the FET Open Project Africa. In 2017, he received the Termits EU Robert Brown Early Career Principal Investigator Award. Yaron, the floor is yours. Thank you for our, uh, accepting our invitation. Thank you, uh, Mehmet, for the kind introduction and also for the invite to, uh, to give a presentation in this very nice uh, uh, seminar series you have uh, here ongoing. Um, so indeed, my name is Jeroen Rookma, and today I will present uh, some of, we, of the work we do on systems uh, where we try to understand vascular organization uh, in a tissue engineering concept. So as Mehmet indicated, we also do quite some work on actual biofabrication and bioengineering. Uh, but for the presentation today, I will focus a little bit on some of the other work uh, that we are doing. Uh, also focusing a lot on the chicken uh, cam uh, assays that we have developed in our in our lab. So of course we all know uh, what vascular networks are and why they are important uh, in natural tissues, but also in in engineered tissues. Uh, and and one of the main reasons that we have vascular networks, either in the body or in engineered tissue, um, is to supply the cells within that tissue with uh, nutrients and oxygen. So in that sense, uh, the vascular network is really a transport system, which is transporting uh, nutrients and oxygen to the cells, uh, but also waste materials from the, from the cells uh, as well. Um, and adding vascular networks to engineered tissue is, is something that a lot of groups have been working on already for, for quite a long time. Uh, and the rationale there, uh, a long time ago, when I actually started uh, this type of research with uh, Shulamit Levenberg and the group of Bob Langer, uh, was that, that uh, at that time, um, I mean, engineered tissues could be prepared in the lab, and if they were <clears throat> larger, you could use, for instance, a perfusion bioreactor to supply the nutrients um, to the cells in that tissue. Uh, but then if you would implant the tissue in an in a animal or or uh, maybe later on in a patient, um, the tissue had to rely on the vascular ingrowth from the host, which is generally a rather slow process, uh, meaning that especially the cells in the, in the middle of the construct can, uh, can die due to nutrient limitations. Um, and what has been the thought uh, already for a long time is that maybe it's uh, actually uh, possible to add vascular networks already during culture in the lab. So adding endothelial cells, for instance, that organize into pre-vascular networks uh, that hopefully after implantation can connect to the vasculature of the host, uh, thus leading to faster vascularization and better integration of the engineered tissue. Um, so I've been working on this, uh, this type of research already for a long time. I think uh, the first publication was already in 2005, uh, which was to work together with, uh, with Shulamit Levenberg, uh, where we added endothelial cells and smooth muscle, muscle precursor cells to uh, engineered muscle tissues, uh, and showed that we could not only get um, vascular structures uh, during in vitro culture, but that those structures also connected to the vasculature of, uh, of a mouse or a rat after implantation and actually became actively perfused, uh, also leading to better survival of the implanted tissue. And since then, I have been uh, focusing on the vascularization on, of different types of tissue, so working, for instance, on bone uh, and currently mainly focusing on, on, on cardiac tissue. Uh, but also always going for the process of, uh, of self-organization of the cells. So 
making use of the self-organization capacity of your endothelial cells and vascular cells uh, to end up with uh, vascular-like networks. Um, but that has also led us to the realization that by itself, that strategy is not going to be sufficient to add an optimal vascular network to an engineered tissue. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, as you clearly see on this slide, uh, the vasculature is really a multi-skill network. Uh, so here on the left, you actually see a picture of uh, the chick uh, chorioallantoic membrane. Uh, so this is actually the membrane of the chicken embryo that you see here in the middle of the slide uh, that forms uh, so, uh, around the yolk of the egg. And actually the, the embryo uses this membrane uh, to get the nutrients from the yolk, but also to get the oxygen into the embryo, enabling it to grow. And what you really nicely see in these type of images is that clearly the vascular network is a multi-skill network. So you have these bigger vessels coming from the embryo, which are uh, branching into increasingly smaller vessels. Uh, and the reason for that is that you need the bigger vessels to basically uh, bridge larger distances without too much of a pressure drop, uh, while you also need uh, very small vessels to actually be able to reach all the cells within the tissue, uh, or in this case of the chorioallantoid membrane. Uh, and also if you zoom in a little bit deeper uh, and look at the actual flow of the, of the red blood cells, so we'll come back to that later as well, uh, you you'd see that it's not only a multi-skill network in terms of organization, but it's also a multi-skill network in terms of fluid flow. So clearly here in the bigger vessels, the flow velocity is a lot higher than what you see here in these uh, smaller vessels. And of course, that multi-skill aspect is something that is very difficult to achieve if we only rely on um, on the organization of endothelial cells in an engineering setting. Uh, but still, we feel that it's important to at least try to understand what is regulating uh, this multi-skill organization to see if we can use that to our benefit in an engineering setting as well. And I think really the goal, what we are aiming for, and not only our lab, but I think a lot of labs uh, throughout the world, uh, is to really go for something you could maybe call uh, prefascularized tissue engineering 2.0, uh, where the goal is not to have prefascular networks and your engineered tissue, but already to have that multi-skill organization uh, before implantation. Uh, and of course, optimally, then the mechanical properties of the vascular network are also such that maybe you can even microsurgically connect it uh, upon implantation. Uh, meaning that the entire tissue will be perfused uh, and vascularized right from the start after, uh, after implantation. So I would say that is probably uh, the holy grail in terms of uh, pre-vascularized tissue engineering. And of course, if we talk about organization and tissue engineering, uh, one of the first things that come to mind is, of course, uh, biofabrication. So I think over the, over the past uh, maybe 10, 15 years, there have been, uh, has been a lot of progress in terms of 3D bioprinting and other uh, biofabrication technology uh, that really allows us to fabricate uh, complex organization within a tissue engineering setting. So here are just uh, two examples uh, of, of the past years uh, where the researchers have focused on creating uh, vascular networks that are even uh, active in terms of oxygen transport and, uh, and here it's in combination with an alveoli or of, of a heart, uh, but which can also really uh, bridge the scale from very small blood vessels, which are then integrated in a very big um, construct, like in this case, the, uh, the bioprinted heart of, uh, of Adam Feinberg. So there is a lot of, of effort uh, and progress in terms of biofabrication, where it's now also possible to make not only the bigger vessels, uh, but also some of the very uh, small capillaries. Uh, unfortunately, it's still very difficult to combine all those skills within a single print. So often there is a trade-off between either having very high uh, high resolution or having a technology that uh, can also produce large volumes in a, in a certain amount of time. 
But I think that is not only the only limitation if we look into fabricating these, uh, these vascular network. Because another very important thing to keep in mind, in my opinion, is that uh, tissues, whether it be engineered tissues or natural tissues, but maybe even the more for engineered tissues, uh, is that they are not generally very stable uh, entities. Uh, meaning that there will be a, a lot of remodeling and, and reorganization over time if you put these, uh, these tissues in culture or after implantation. And this is illustrated here by a very nice movie where uh, a, a spheroid of uh, MSCs is placed in a gel environment. Uh, and you clearly see that over time cells start migrating from this spheroid and they basically invade the entire uh, hydrogel environment. And of course, that is exactly the process that we actually used in the past to end up with our, our vascular network in our engineered tissues. But it also means that um, if you biofabricate a tissue uh, and you then culture it for longer amounts of time, you are probably going to lose at least part of that organization that you, that you added to that engineered tissue uh, using, uh, using the biofabrication approach. Uh, and in my opinion, that also means that um, if you then still want to end up with uh, the multi-scale organized vascular network that you intended, you probably at, le at least need to have some control over this remodeling and reorganization process. And that is actually the focus that we, that we try to, uh, to focus on in our group. Um, so it's really trying to understand what, what signals actually control this vascular organization uh, and then try to translate that to a tissue engineering environment uh, within the end goal to, to try to engineer these hierarchically vascularized tissues, uh, but also microphysiological systems. So the approach is often to, to start off with, for instance, a bioprinting approach uh, for the initial organization, but then also include uh, signals or technologies to uh, to try to control that further uh, remodeling of the of the vascular networks. But of course, then the first step is to try to understand what are actually these signals that that drive this vascular organization. Um, because only if we know those signals, we we can then look into whether we may be able to to use these for our engineering settings. And of course, one of the, the first things to then look at is, well, how does this actually work during embryonic development? Um, so there is a lot of knowledge about what is driving vascular organization in embryonic development. Um, and it turns out that actually mechanical signals, they play a very important uh, role in this organization. Uh, and then specifically the, the fluid flow shear stresses. Uh, and that comes, uh, becomes very clear if you look, for instance, at these two examples. So here on the left, uh, we see a study where, um, where they looked at the organization again of the chicken uh, cam membrane uh, at, at, uh, at different moments in time. Uh, and what you see if you compare the, the top panels with the bottom panels uh, is that the top panel is the situation at the onset of the, of the perfusion, so when the heart starts beating. Uh, at that moment, you still have really like a vascular plexus type of organization of your vascular network. Um, so there's not yet really the differentiation of individual vessels. And there's also not yet really a differentiation of the, of the arterial and venous system. Uh, but if you look approximately one day later, so only 26 hour, hours, you see a very com different situation where this more or less non-organized vascular network has remodeled towards a system that is very organized and that also clearly has the distinction between the venous and the arterial system. Um, to give a little bit more evidence that indeed the fluid flow is really playing a role here, uh, I also added this study where they looked at, at mouse embryo development uh, and they produced a knockout, knockout where the endothelial cells did not have the mechanical receptors to respond to fluid flow shear stresses. Um, and then if you um, compare the, the development of that knockout mouse with a, with a wild type knockout mouse, uh, you see that basically that 
results in the failure to uh, to develop this organized vascular network. Uh, again, adding proof to the hypothesis that it's actually the fluid flow shear stress that at least in part uh, regulates this uh, vascular organization. So uh, that is something that, that, that is already known, but we also now want to investigate how can we actually use that and maybe also perturb that to see if that is something we can use in an engineering setting. Uh, and in our lab for that, we use, uh, we make a lot of use of this uh, chicken choreo uh, membrane system. Um, so some of you may, be, uh, uh, may, may know this system already. Uh, so a lot of research is being done actually with in ovo chem system. So that means that you take a chicken egg, a fertilized chicken egg, and you peel away part of the shell, uh, this giving you access to the, to the chem. Uh, and then there you already see that indeed at the top of this egg, you have a very nice access to this highly vascularized membrane. If we zoom in a little bit on the histology of the membrane, you see that it's actually a uh, cellularized membrane. So it starts, uh, it, it um, consists of two epithelium layers. So these are two different layers that come together during the development of the, this membrane. Uh, which basically enclose a more uh, vascularized mesenchyme uh, in which you get the development of all these different blood vessels. And the nice thing is that for early embryonic development days, uh, it's really a flat system with only a single layer of uh, blood vessels, which makes it a very nice uh, system to, to study. Now, in our uh, group, we do most of the research actually with ex ovo systems, basically meaning that you remove the contact from the egg from the eggshell, uh, and we, you can culture it, for instance, in a Petri dish, but in our case, we make use of a lot of uh, PDMS-based systems. Uh, and then the complexity of that system depends on what we actually want to, uh, to investigate. Um, so this can be a simple uh, container made out of PDMS, but it can also be more uh, complex systems where we uh, add, for instance, also microfluidics uh, to locally perturb the development of this, uh, this vascular network. And then if you really start looking at this uh, vascular organization in this type of, uh, of, of system, so I think the big uh, advantage is that now we can see the entire uh, vascularized membrane as opposed to only a part if you use the in ovo uh, systems. Uh, so this really enables you to follow very nicely over time what is actually happening with the uh, organization of these, these vascular networks. So we can see at, uh, at early embryonic development days, like day three, we still um, have a lot of this vascular plexus like organization. Uh, the vessels are very torturous. We already have the differentiation or the distinction between the larger vessels uh, and the smaller vessels. But when we progress over the development of this chicken embryo, uh, you see that the vascularization really normalizes to what we know uh, from a more adult situation. So we have less and less of these torturous vessels. Uh, we have more branching and also uh, less of this vascular plexus type organization. Um, if you go on longer than day six, you also see that you get multiple layers of, uh, of vessels that start stacking um, on top of each other. So this already enables you to really nicely look at the organization of these vascular networks. Uh, but of course, we're actually really interesting in what are then the signals that is driving this organization. So uh, we also worked a lot on tools trying to visualize what is actually happening in terms of uh, blood flow in these systems. So a first tool that we are using is um, laser speckle contrast imaging or LSCI. Uh, and this is actually a laser-based uh, system where you shine a laser on, on your sample. Uh, and it's actually the scattering of the moving particles. So in this case, mainly the, the red blood cells in the blood vessels that give you a very specific speckle pattern that is then picked up again uh, by the camera. Uh, so any, um, any, any tissue will give you a speckle pattern, but because we're actually also looking at moving uh, 
uh, entities, uh, you will actually get a variation in this petal pattern over time. Uh, and that variation will be mainly in the parts or in the tissues where you actually have these, these moving objects. So by then analyzing the, the changes in this speckle pattern over time, uh, you can make a contrast map, which is basically a heat map for these changes. So for the movement of these particles, uh, and then you can transform that contrast map into a perfusion map by um, basically uh, working from um, from these these placements uh, basically to the to the fluid perfusion uh, quantities uh, within these type of uh, of systems. Um, I think the downside of the LSCI is that it doesn't really give you absolute values for the fluid flow. So you can do experiments where we looked, for instance, at phantoms where we know what type of fluid flow we push through the phantom because it's driven by a uh, by a syringe pump. Uh, and there we show that uh, at least with these optimized uh, vessel-like systems, we can get more or less a linear fit between the signals that we get and the fluid flow velocity. Uh, but it, it, this is really in an, in an optimized situation and often for our CAM systems, that is, that is not really the case. Uh, so it's very difficult to actually get absolute values on the fluid flow velocities um, with LSCI. But what we do get is this type of, uh, of video. So it really nicely displays the dynamics of, uh, of fluid flow. Um, so it shows you the regions where you have a lot of perfusion. So here in the, in the red and the yellow colors, uh, but it also nicely gives you the pulsatility of the fluid flow so that you can, for instance, use uh, the, to determine the heartbeat of the, of the chicken embryo in this case. Uh, the frame rate and the resolution that that really depends a lot on the uh, on the setup that you use in terms of optical properties. So by using different lenses uh, and different collimators, you can uh, play a little bit with the resolution that you can uh, that you can attain. And because it gives you a very nice overview of the dynamics, you can also start looking into uh, into the different regions of the developing embryo. Uh, so here again, we see the embryo in the middle with the beating heart here in the middle uh, around embryonic development day four. Um, and then if you look at that with LSCI at, uh, at a low magnification, you really nicely see the organization uh, of the different vessels and uh, basically the flow of the blood out of the chicken egg uh, embryo and then moving back into the embryo via this uh, venal uh, uh, loop here at, uh, at the bottom. So with that type of information, you can, for instance, um, determine the ratio between the arterial and the, and the venal flow. Uh, and one of the things that we noticed is that if you go further in the embryonic development, you actually see a stronger development in this arterial versus venal uh, flow. So at embryonic development day three, uh, the magnitude of these two flows are more or less similar. Whereas if you go further, you really see a distinction uh, where the arterial flow velocities are becoming a lot higher than what you see, uh, for instance, in the vein. So it also gives you information about the local development of these more complex uh, blood flows. Now, the nice thing about this LSCI technology is that it's, of course, not only compatible with uh, a developing chicken embryo, but you can also use it, for instance, to look at the perfusion of, uh, of engineered tissues. Um, and as a proof of principle, we have used it on an, on an engineered muscle tissue. So this is a rather big construct based on fibrin. Um, where we seed the fibrin with C2C12 uh, mouse my myoblast. Uh, we have a fishing line running through the construct, which we pull out after compaction of the tissue. Uh, and that gives us a perfusible cavity that we can see with, with endothelial cells. Uh, and then through that cavity, uh, we can perfuse uh, a liquid and then use the LSCI uh, to image the perfusion of our system. Now, one of the downsides is that in order for this to work, your, uh, your liquid actually has to have scattering properties. So it will not work with ordinary uh, culture medium. 
but you have to add something to uh, for the fluid to to make it scatter. Uh, and in our case, we use something called intralipid. So this is uh, these are um, a suspension of, of of fine lipid lipid droplets, which give you this uh, this scattering properties of the of the fluid that you can then image. And some of the interesting things that we saw here, for instance, is that if we compare a construct where the channel is not seeded with endothelial cells with a construct where the channel is seeded, uh, we get some information actually on the barrier system of, um, of that endothelial lining. So showing that in the, in the system without endothelial cells, you see a lot of fluid actually escaping from the channel into the into the surrounding uh, hydrogel or, or tissue whereas in the endothelialized channel uh, the liquids uh, tends to stay a lot more within the uh, within the perfused uh, channel um, so I'm definitely not saying that this is an optimal system to look into barrier function uh, but it does give you some information about these type of uh, of processes. So if we then try to uh, to look a little bit into LSCI, what it can do and what it cannot do, um, I think it, it it is really nice and determine the relative perfusion of a specific region. Um, and it's also great to determine the dynamic aspects of this perfusion. So looking at things like heartbeat or or more local uh, pulsatility of the of the fluid flow. Um, what is also very nice in practice is that it's a contactless system. Um, so in this case, for the larger magnifications, the distance between the sample and the detector is approximately five millimeters. So that enables you to image things without really disturbing your, your sample. The downsides, uh, well, I already mentioned that the fluid uh, requires a scattering agent. So often you need to add something to the medium uh, to make it visible. Um, and it also is not very great to give you absolute values on the on the fluid flow velocities or uh, or the fluxes within your within your system. So to focus a little bit more on on the actual fluid flow velocities, we we have also developed uh, a method based on side screen uh, side stream dark field imaging. Um, and this is a method that is based on, on shining basically green light on your sample. Uh, again, this green light is, uh, is being scattered by your sample, but it's also very specifically uh, taken up by uh, or absorbed by the, uh, by the red, uh, red blood cells within your system. And that basically means that wherever you have a red blood cell in your system, you get less light back to your camera, so that results in a dark spot uh, at that location. Um, and then, of course, if you do that on a system where you have these moving red blood cells, you basically see the moving uh, um, dark spots, which are then uh, a representation of the, of the red blood cells. Um, and as you see here in these two examples, is that it, it, it really nicely um, visualizes the actual fluid flow velocities uh, within these, these CAM systems. Uh, and you see, for instance, uh, interesting differences between the situation where we look at day three, where the heart just started beating. So you have some pulsatile flow moving up and down in the bigger vessels, but hardly any flow or also only this pulsatile flow in the smaller vessels. Uh, whereas if we look two days later, you see a very nicely established flow in one direction, uh, which also tends to be a lot more constant uh, over time. Of course, this is then probably in the venous region. If you look in an arterial region, uh, you would have more uh, pulsatility within your uh, flow. Now, and because we, with this method, we can uh, actually image the individual uh, red blood cells moving in our system, uh, that also enables you to, to really quantify, quantify the, the fluid flow velocities in these, uh, in these systems. Um, so here you see some examples of, uh, of red blood cell tracking that we did, uh, did in our group. So I think here, it's still manual tracking, but we're also working on machine learning tools to, to try to have an automated tracking of uh, red blood cells in these type of, uh, in these type of systems. Um, 
So this will give you a lot of information, not only on the organization of the blood vessels, but also on the actual fluid flow velocities in these type of uh, in these type of systems. And then, of course, you can do uh, do a lot of quantification, especially if it's not manual anymore, but automated. Uh, and then trying to combine, um, for instance, looking at the variation in the microcapillary diameter uh, and linking that to the to the velocity of the erythrocyte in those type of systems. And of course, if you know the diameter of your tube and you know the, the velocity, uh, you can then also calculate the, the fluid flow shear stresses um, within these, these systems. And then what we want to use this type of information for is really trying to, to see if we can make a link between local fluid flow shear stresses and then looking at um, um, vascular organization or vascular sprouting at later time points so to see if we can make a predictive uh, connection between uh, the, the, the sprouting uh, that we see happening over time with the actual fluid flow shear stresses at those locations uh, prior to the to the sprouting of the uh, of the vessels. Now, one of the things we found out uh, already uh, ten years ago, I think, is that when looking at vascular organization, it's not only fluid flow shear stresses that that play a role in 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 determining the, the vascular organization. Um, it turns out that also uh, stresses and strains within engineered tissues are are important in regulating vascular organization. Um, and the way we found this out, out was actually by making use of these uh, shaped uh, containers uh, in which we poured uh, small micro tissues that are that then um, basically compacted into these these shaped uh, tissues. Uh, and these tissues have the tendency to to minimize their volume towards a sphere. Uh, but depending on the pre-compaction in the initial system, you end up with a stable, a uh, situation where uh, um, at some point um, these tissues tend to produce so much matrix uh, that they will not compact further. Um, and you can do that basically for, uh, for different shaped containers. And then by basically um, correcting the shape uh, for this compaction process, you can end up with, can end up with, uh, with the shape that you want to have. So to end up with a square, you, for instance, have to start with a square with these exaggerated corners. Um, and you can then use this process to make uh, these micro tissues in, in any shape that you want without the addition of any biomaterials. So these tissues, they don't contain any biomaterials or hydrogel at all. Uh, it's really only the cells and the matrix that these cells uh, secrete. And what is then interesting, if you start looking at this compaction process in the different uh, tissues, is that the compaction is not uh, constant over the, the cross-section or the volume of these different tissues. Um, so here on the bottom, you see a heat map basically of the, of the nuclei. They were stained um, and then uh, a stack of different pictures were taken and a heat map was created. Uh, and what is clearly visible is that there is a lot more nuclei on the outside of these, these tissues. Um, but also the amount of nuclei on the outside really seems to increase if you have sharper corners um, in these type of tissues. And that is also what you see if you, uh, if you quantify it. So this is the number of nuclei here in the middle and then moving to the, to the corner. Um, what is also interesting is if you basically impair the compaction with blevastatin and this other compound, we don't see this really differentiation in where we find the nuclei in the end. So there is a lot more compaction in these, uh, in these samples with the sharp corner, and there is a lot more cells on the outside, uh, probably resulting in more tension in, in these regions. Now, and the interesting thing is then if we start looking at what is happening with the vascular organization in these systems. So here we made these tissues with co-cultures of endothelial cells and MSCs, uh, where at day one, we see that the uh, red labeled endothelial cells are basically in the middle of these micro tissues surrounded by the MSCs. Uh, and then they start fusing into these, uh, these bigger shapes. And then if you look over time, we see that they more or less start remodeling within the within the uh, within the tissue, uh, 
Uh, and in this case, you look at the staining with CD31 for the endothelial cells. Uh, and there again, you see that you see a lot more vascular structures uh, on the outside of these um, of these uh, these tissues. And also there appear to be more vascular structures in the corners of the samples where you have these sharp corners, like in this case in the triangle. Um, and then also if we start quantifying that endothelial structures, indeed you see that um, that you see more at the corners as opposed to in the middle. And indeed we get more vascular structures if we look at the sharp corners in the triangle and we compare that for instance with the square or with the circle. Now, what is again interesting is if we compare it with the, with the impaired compaction, so where we add the bled bistatin and the other compound, uh, if we look at the normal compaction, we see that these vascular structures are generally organized perpendicular to the direction of the strain within these tissues. Whereas in the impaired compaction, we, we hardly see any preferred organization at all. So this for us re really was a clear signal that this organization is responding um, to the stresses and strain within these systems and, and they really organize perpendicular uh, to that strain. Now, and in the end, we find out that a lot of this is connected with, uh, with FEGF signaling. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the sharp corners, we see a lot more expression of FEGF again in the corners than in the middle. And this is uh, probably FEGF secretion by the, uh, by the MSCs in the systems. Uh, and we also see more expression of the uh, FEGF receptor uh, more in the corners than in the centers. And then this is uh, most likely in the, in the endothelial cells. So this really led to the conclusion that um, the, the, the cells, the local environment really responds to these local stresses and strains resulting in preferred vascular organization in these, uh, in these corners. And of course, then we wanted to find out whether this is also something that is happening in our in our CAM system. So whether in the CAM also there is a role of, of, of tension on, on vascular organization within these systems. Um, so in order to investigate that, we started to, to culture these uh, ex ovo CAM uh, within differently shaped uh, containers. So for instance, in circles or square uh, or triangles or, or stars. And what you already see here uh, is that this vascularized cam really starts, um, well, shaping to the shape of the container. So with my mouse, I now more or less um, track the external uh, shape of this vascularized cam. And you see that it doesn't yet uh, come to the edges of the container, but still it's already shaped uh, according to the, uh, to the shape of the, of the container. And what you all also see is that this very conserved organization of the of the cam, which is more or less replicated in the in the circular container, uh, it starts to look very different in the uh, in the square uh, containers. Um, so I will skip this one because I have a nicer one with uh, with all the other shapes as well. Um, and a very nice thing, uh, and this is still ongoing work, so I cannot come up to any conclusions uh, yet other than that we, we see an effect. Uh, but as you clearly see, if, we, if you zoom in on, these, uh, on the similar regions within the different shapes, uh, you see that the vascular actually, vasculature looks very different uh, in the different environments. So we not only see a difference in, in how straight the vessels are, but also in the branching pattern. Uh, and we're trying to increase the number of samples to also see if this is really a conserved effect uh, or whether it's, it's, it's more an effect on, uh, on individual samples. Um, but at least this for us is a, is a nice indication that again, this, uh, this tension that is being um, made within these membranes due to the culture into different shape containers uh, does have an effect on the uh, on the on the vascular branching and the, and the vascular organization. Uh, and one of the things we're also looking into is whether this is then a dynamic process or whether this is a, a predetermined process. Um, so for that, we are using uh, a system where we can actually change the shape of the container over time uh, using these these motors. Uh, so then you can start, for instance, with a circular container uh, 
um, and then compress it into a uh, into a square, um, and and then look at what is happening to the uh, to the vascular um, organization. Um, and some initial things that we have seen is that uh, if we compare the before compression with the after compression, uh, it seems to be that um, that the compression itself leads to a lot more perfusion within your uh, within your uh, chicken cam. So you see that the entire cam uh, appears to be a lot redder. Um, also, there appears to be more blood flow within the bigger vessels. Um, but also within the within the very fine microvasculature that you that you see here, uh, so it looks like there is an elevated pressure in your in your blood system, uh, and that leads to uh, well, in this case, it seems to be a more torturous uh, vasculature, uh, but definitely in more uh, blood flow uh, in your in your system. So in conclusion, uh, this has learned us that uh, the shape of the vascular cam uh, really adapts to the shape of the container, uh, and that this is already long the case before the edges of the container are reached. Uh, so that for us was uh, was very interesting uh, there. Um, and that this then again affects the organization of the vascular network in the cam. Um, and when looking at the shape shifting, we see a very direct effect on the fluid flow dynamics. So there appears to be a, an increase in the fluid flow. Uh, and we're still investigating whether this also results in a structural effect uh, on, the, on the vascular um, organization. Um, I see that it's already, um, well, 7.45 in my location, but 11.45 at yours. So the, the last part, I will just go through uh, a little bit faster because it doesn't really focus on the on the cam anymore. Uh, but I also wanted to add some slides on the work that we do on virtual angiogenesis, uh, where we're working on computational models to try to predict vascular organization. Uh, so all the previous work is look, really looking into biological systems and trying to make a link there between, for instance, fluid flow uh, or the tension uh, uh, within the cam and, and vascular organization. Uh, but you can imagine that that can lead to, to a lot of data very fast. Uh, so one of the approaches to sometimes try to make sense of this data uh, is to make use of, uh, of computational uh, modeling. Um, and the type of computational modeling that we do uh, in our lab, in, an, uh, in a collaboration with, with Roland Merckx from, uh, from Leiden University, uh, is that we use models where, uh, where we try to see what is the effect of different, uh, different parameters uh, on vascular organization and vascular sprouting. So the types of parameters that you can include there are, for instance, the stiffness of the material that you see here on the left, um, here in the middle, it's more the, the degradation of a matrix that, uh, that leads to the release of factors that then in turn uh, gives you the organization of the network. Uh, whereas here on the right, it's a lot more about uh, the secretion of factors that, that result in vascular network. Um, and one of the focuses that we have in our group is also trying to add flow uh, into these systems too. Uh, to also include the regulation uh, of flow on, on vascular organization. So the type of models that we use for this are uh, what we call cellular pot models. So these models are in essence already uh, quite old. Uh, and what these models do is that they basically uh, describe random cell mo mobility. So here you see, for instance, a situation of, of three different cells. Uh, they live on a grid in 2D. Um, and basically what you do is that at specific time steps, you look at the edges of these cells and then the model determines whether the cell wants to migrate here in this space or not. And basically how it decides that is to make use of, a, uh, of an energy equation in which you can put a lot of different variables, uh, including, for instance, cell adhesion, uh, but also volume conser conservation so the cells cannot become too big. Uh, but also the, the attraction of things like growth factors or, uh, or fluid flow. Um, 
So then basically in each iteration, the cells determines if they move into a new situation or not. Uh, and then you can let that model run to, uh, to see what it, it leads to you, uh, what it gives you in terms of organization on the, on the long term. Um, so in our case, we, uh, in, in these initial models, we have been mainly looking at, uh, at the secretion of an angiogenic factor by the, by the cells themselves and starting to look at the importance of, for instance, the decay rate of that factor, uh, the secretion rate of the factor, and also the chemotactic strength of, those, uh, of that factor. Um, so because these are computational models, you can do a lot of variations very easily. Uh, and then you can use those variations to see what combination of these three factors uh, give you an organized um, vascular network uh, or not. So in this case, you see that, uh, that for the lower de decay rates, um, there appears to be some, some vascular networks formation. And if we focus on this one, for instance, and then start varying the chemotactic strength, uh, you, you again see that if you have a more potent factor, uh, that leads to uh, more finely distributed uh, vascular networks in these type of systems. Now, and one of the things we, we have also added to these models is to see what would be the effect of, of external gradients of, uh, of growth factors. So this is trying to replicate studies, for instance, uh, that, that you see here, where you have a gel channel uh, bordered by two fluid flow channels, uh, where you can have gradients of HF moving from one side to the other side and looking at the effect of that on, uh, on vascular organization in the gels. And if we then start, uh, start doing that and look at the organization, what we see is that, again, um, whether we get the, the vascular networks really depends on the, on the properties of the, of the factors that are secreted by the cells. Uh, but the external gradient of FEDGEF that we have in this system, which is basically the grayscale uh, gradient that you see at the back, that really determines the organization or the orientation of these vascular networks. So we also see that if we don't have network formation, we still get migration of the cells towards the positive direction of that gradient. Um, but also if we do get vascular network formation, they really orient themselves towards this, uh, this external gradient of, uh, of FEDGEF. So again, this gives you a very nice tool to start play with uh, a lot of different parameters uh, to see what types of networks that, that give you. And of course, in the end, uh, the goal is to then connect this type of, uh, of work uh, with the experiments that we, that we do, for instance, in our, uh, in our CAM, uh, chicken uh, CAM uh, models. So some of the things that, uh, that we've seen with this, uh, well, you can call it virtual angiogenesis, uh, is that uh, it appears that you really need steep gradients of this, uh, these angiogenic factors to, to end up with, uh, with, uh, with a network. Um, and also that, well, if you have a steep gradient, then of course the chemotactic strength, so the strength with which these cells respond to those gradients, um, also uh, determines whether you get a network. So if the cell response to the gradient is stronger, then of course you need uh, a smaller uh, concentration uh, for the cells to form, uh, to form a, a network. So in this case, we compared both uh, the secreted angiogenic compound with an external VEGF gradient um, over the system. And it looked like the, the secreted compound actually determines whether there is going to be a, uh, a network or not, uh, while the external FEDGEF gradient more or less influences the organization and, uh, and the orientation of those network. Um, and what we then want to add to the models is, uh, is to add fluid flow to these models to see how that affects uh, the gradients of the secreted compound, uh, but also of the external FEDGEF gradient um, and in the end, uh, maybe also the effect of the mechanical environment uh, of, these, of these cells. So with that, I, uh, 
I come to the to the end of my presentation, and I hope we still have some some time for questions. Uh, but of course, first I want to thank uh, the the people in the lab. So a lot of the work I have presented today is done by uh, by Tasana Padmanaban, uh, who has been working a lot on the computational modeling and uh, and the CAM systems. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank uh, our collaborators, Windelt and Atta, uh, more on the imaging on the LSCI uh, and, and the other imaging type work that we do in my lab. Uh, Roland Merck at Leiden University for the, uh, um, for, the, for the modeling on the vascularization together with Eva Deinen from Wageningen University. Uh, and Nicola Rivron, who did a very nice work already quite long ago on the, on the shape micro tissues. Of course, I also want to thank our funding agencies and I want to thank you for your, uh, for your attention. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you for this uh, fantastic talk, uh, Jaron, appreciate it. Uh, many questions came in. Uh, one is, uh, from Fernando, do you relate your findings to the development of different endothelial linings in different organs, such as brain, liver, kidney, eye? I think that's a very interesting question. I mean, there is a lot of developments uh, in, in terms of uh, organ-specific uh, endothelial, and it, it's becoming clearer and clearer that an endothelial cell is not an endothelial cell, but it, it's very specific to uh, to a specific location. Um, I think, in essence, that's a little bit a downside of the of the CAM system. So the the choroallantoic membrane is is basically a extra corporal um, structure that, well, I guess it's a little bit comparable to. Uh, um, to to what you have in the in the womb. Um, where it's an extracorporeal system that that basically delivers the nutrients and the, and the oxygen into the into the developing embryo, um, and as such, you cannot really place it as a specific uh, organ. Um, so I think it's also not very fit to then look into the difference of the of the different uh, endothelial cells. Of course, in theory, you can focus a lot more on what is happening within the embryo. Um, but we tend to culture our embryos only for relative short amounts of time. Uh, and then they are still very small, so we cannot really focus in, uh, into specific uh, um, um, organs with, uh, with enough detail. Thank you. Um, the fluid you use for blood scattering didn't interrupt bloodstream or red blood cells. I think you were adding some lipids. Yeah, so uh, the, the intralipid we only have to add if we if we look at uh, the engineered tissue. So there, for the engineered muscle tissue, it's um, well we have to add intralipid to the to the culture medium because the culture medium itself is not scattering. Um, for all the cam work, it's the it's the blood of the chick itself that is actually the, the scattering fluid. So you don't have to add any additional components there. Thank you. Can modeling of vascular map of tissues normalize the production of vascularization or are there still gaps in this approach this way? Um, I, I think there is still uh, a lot of gaps. So, I mean, when we send out with this, set out with this type of tissue, we really hope that we could find some um, driving mechanisms of vascular organization so that we can start off with producing like a, like a blueprint or a starting organization and then add these signals to control the further organization and especially the sprouting of the microvasculature. Um, but that is something that is still very, very difficult to control. So we are still very far from knowing exactly how we can control that mechanism. Uh, what I do think that this this type of research is very useful for is on, on the one hand, really understanding the importance of this multiscale organization and also how it relates to things like fluid flow shear stresses and fluid dynamics. Um, and it may help you to identify other driving mechanisms that can potentially control uh, the vascular organization. Uh, so we know a lot about fluid flows. We know a lot about uh, um, growth factors in terms of driving vascular organization. 
uh, but we know a lot less about this uh, this role of tension or strain uh, on, on these type of processes. Thank you. One other question came in, but I'm not sure if it's correct. Why are there more vasculature in the corners? Is it because of cell repulsion or biocompatibility with the scaffold? Um, so I think this relates to the uh, to the micro tissue work that we did. So <laughs> all these micro tissues, they are material free uh, and they're also cultured in a um, in a free floating uh, situation. So there is no interaction with with additional material. It's really uh, the cells themselves that are sitting in their in their own matrix. Um, and what we could establish is that there is a really a link between the local compaction. So if, if you put cells together in a pellet or whatever, they're going to compact, they want to be close to each other. Um, and they're going to secrete the matrix, which allows them to grab on and to, 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 to compact. Uh, so what we saw is that you get a lot more compaction in these corners. We don't really know why we do get it. I think it has something to do with these tissues wanting to go to, to a minimal surface area. Um, and of course, that's easy if you start off from a circle, but it's a lot more difficult if you start up with, uh, with a triangle, for instance. Um, so they want to go towards a circle, but it's probably the, the, the matrix that they have made themselves that is preventing that deformation. And as an end result there, you end up with a lot more compaction in these corners, uh, especially if you have a sharp corner. And our hypothesis is then that gives rise to tension, which in turn stimulates the, um, the, the, the vascular organization in those regions. Um, and that is supported if we impair the compaction. So if we impair the compaction with levastatin, we don't see this effect. So there's definitely a link with the compaction. Um, but of course, blebistatin is also very likely to have an effect, a direct effect on vascular organization. So, it, yeah, it's a bit difficult to have a 100% conclusive effect, but we do know that there is a link between the compaction and, and the vascular organization in those regions. Thank you. There's another question. Uh, this is about the result of the work for scaffold fabrication. The more corner a scaffold has, the better vasculature is obtained, is that correct? Um, yeah, so again, this, 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 this was in the scaffold free tissue. So indeed, if you make micro tissue shape micro tissue, it seems that the more or the, yeah, the sharper corners you have, the more vascularization you get in, in, these, uh, in these tissues. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, for this egg work, do you uh, break the egg? Or do you see through the egg? Um, so like the shell, our, the shell. Yeah. yeah. So, so most of our work, we actually break the egg and we transfer it to uh, to PDMS based systems. So you have to be very careful when you do that, uh, as of as to not to disturb the development. And I think uh, Prasanna, after having done this for a couple of years, has really become uh, <laughs> become an expert on it. So yeah, it has a little bit of a learning curve of, uh, of, of in terms of handling and well, definitely you, you lose embryos as well if, if they get damaged during transfer. Uh, but yeah, you really break the egg and then pour it in the, in the PDMS container. Um, and the nice thing is that the embryo also always uh, floats to the top again. So you always end up with your embryo at the top of your uh, of your PDMS system. Thank you. Uh, this embryonic development is nice. Just wondering, uh, this vascular genesis or geogenesis, does it apply to cancer progress in the body? Uh, you know, embryo is attracting the vessels and cancer is doing the same thing. Can we use your studies to model cancer in the body? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, so if we look at cancer vascularization, it's a lot driven by, by soluble factors. So, um, well, if, if, if you put it very simply, uh, a tumor, uh, if it grows a lot, you get a hypoxic environment and that gives you a lot of growth factors to, to induce vascular organization uh, or vascular invasion. So 
in, in principle, those are type of things that we can replicate in our systems where we add microfluidic channels to our, to our CAM system. So there we can add gro angiogenic growth factors at these specific locations and look at vascular invasion. Um, but I would say there's probably a lot better systems to, to look into that. So there's very nice microfluidic systems um, with hydrogel pockets bordered by, by fluid flow channels, a little bit like the slide I showed uh, um, with the computational work where you have a lot more control over what is happening in terms of, uh, of vascular organization. Um, so these systems are nice because they are in vivo, but at the same time, you also have a lot less control over, over the perturbation. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I have. Thank you for this great talk and your time, uh, Jaron, appreciate it. Thank you. Very, uh, very welcome. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for attending.